to you about causal methodology and causation in a whiplash medical legal cases. Nice to see you. Uh, and, and what's happened in the, the uh, legal world as well as in the literature on this topic. Um, because that's such an important part of, of, of what happens when, uh, when somebody sustains an injury and the injury is due to somebody else's fault. So, uh, so really that's what the, the essence of my talk is going to be about today and this is really my area in, in forensic medicine. But I did promise I would first talk about very earliest preliminary results of a study of video fluoroscopy. Um, video fluoroscopy is something that is, I think, used a little bit here in uh, Sweden, uh, but not very much, and I don't think anybody pays for it. Is that about right? That you can't really get the studies done. But there are some centers who do this sort of an examination. And, um, those of you who have had the examination know what it is. It's an examination for instability using motion x-ray um, or cine radiography um, of the spine. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's used a lot for uh, the folks who are doing um, the upper cervical, the CCJ, cranial cervical junction uh, procedures as a means of identifying where there may be instability. Uh, the, let's see, how do I advance here? No, not that way. Uh, there we go. Um, so the people who use it are very happy with it. The uh, people who are on, for example, the side of the insurers or radiologists from a variety of uh, places say, ah, it doesn't really mean much because it's, it's, uh, it, we really don't know what's normal. Um, and so the, uh, the, the first research that really started demonstrating upper cervical instability or upper cervical uh, injury to the ligaments was uh, Krakenis and his group out of Norway. They published several papers talking about the fact that upper cervical uh, uh, instability could be documented using MRI and then they backed away from that and published several studies saying, no, we were, so we're sorry, we were wrong, that's not true, uh, you can't really tell the difference. Um, this is, I think, has some political roots to it as to what happened, the politics of the medicine uh, in Norway and sort of altered the, the way they looked at this, this particular issue. There were a lot of problems with the subsequent studies that that group did uh, that said, yeah, no, we were wrong, there really isn't injury. And, um, it was a good illustration of the fact that you can um, get any result you want in a study just by designing the study to get those results. Um, and that's exactly what they did. Um, about 10 years ago or so, I started a study to see if we could validate the use of video fluoro fluoroscopy, or DMX, dynamic motion x-ray is another term for it, as a means of actually detecting injury. So that we could look at people who were not injured, people who were injured, and say, this is a study that has diagnostic accuracy and that this is a study that we can use to actually find people who are injured. We can talk about the probability they're injured given certain findings. So that sounds like a pretty good idea. The difficulty with that is that you have to get a bunch of people who are going to undergo a video fluoroscopy who don't have any symptoms. So this took a long time for us to do this study. But um, I finally actually have the very last of my reads that came to me just like two weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, from this study that's gone on for such a long time. And you all are the first to whom I am presenting these results. So, um, uh, this is what this kind of a study looks like. You can see the patient is filmed down the corner. This is the DMX um, uh, setup for the study. And so the patient moves the neck and you can see dynamically um, the synchronicity of the joints. You can see if the joints are gapping on the side um, and then you can look in the front to back to see if there is too much movement uh, uh, suggesting instability. Uh, what we did was we, we had 77 normal subjects who underwent a study and we collected 34 parameters of, uh, on each uh, of, of the subjects so that we graded 
uh, movement instability, um, synchronicity of movement, um, to see how uh, the, the, uh, the spine moves synchronously or asynchronously. <coughs> um, in uh, 34 different parameters, we had 96 subjects who were injured and symptomatic, 77 who uh, had no recent history of trauma and no symptoms at all. Um, so C0, C1, the upper cervical joint, looking for alar instability or transverse ligament instability and uh, apical ligament instability. So we're looking to see how the, uh, the atlas moves on top of the axis, C1 on C2, and also the occiput on top of C1, and then more standard uh, flexion extension type of instability at C2, 3, C2, 3 through C7. We had two blinded, uh, experienced uh, radiologists reading the study, and then we looked at the study for kappa for uh, coefficient of, <coughs> of, of correlation. So here's what I just got. Uh, what we found looking at odds of if you have this particular finding, what the odds were that you would be in the abnormal group or the injured group, this is what you're going to see. Um, and these are all the significant findings from the crude analysis, that is the analysis that was not adjusted by the other findings. So what you can see, actually, that's interesting here is, uh, that the odds that you're abnormal are highest at C4-5 for flexion, but then C3-4. Uh, both extension and gap, um, and gap as seen uh, on the oblique films at the facets when the head is tilted to the side and looked at from an oblique perspective. Which I thought was very interesting because um, these are two areas that you almost never see um, any finding of abnormality in a healthy person. Whereas C5-6 only had one finding that was abnormal and that, was, that gave us odds of three, uh, three to uh, uh, an odds ratio of three, that there would be abnormality. But the most um, uh, important one was C4-5 in deflection and looking for instability where there was more than, I think, three, three millimeters of instability uh, flexing forward. When we put all this into a model, um, what we found was that for each of these, so this is C1-2 for lateral flexion with the mouth open to see how far there's translation to the side. Uh, this is the C4-5 flexion, uh, C5-6 uh, gapping, and then C6-7 uh, synchron synchrony, which I don't think is very important. In fact, don't pay any attention to that one. But what this tells us is that if you have this and this together, that you have a 3.7 <coughs> times 6.9 <coughs> times odds so you multiply them in the, in the model, uh, adjusted for all the other findings in both of the groups, that you are abnormal, that you have an injury. So you're talking about, um, what, about 25 to 1 probability that this is somebody who has a, is an abnormal. This actually will serve as a highly reliable examination to find people who are truly injured. And that's the point of this. This is the first time uh, for this particular uh, diagnostic uh, uh, study that we actually have diagnostic accuracy uh, figures to talk about. We can say that we're covering uh, almost 80% of the people uh, under the curve, sensitivity and specificity, meaning that this is a, a pretty reliable study. Um, and it also means that um, we do have multiple findings so more than one finding that you increase the odds that this person is injured and they have an injury that is attributable to the trauma that they've suffered. Good enough? How soon after injury did you do the DMX and how late after injury can you do it and find the same thing? I would say that you could do it at any time after injury and find the same thing. Instability is something that usually doesn't resolve on its own. From experience, I can't tell you I know that for sure, but I think that that makes pretty good sense. Um, 
this should be evident right away. But, you know, you're not going to take somebody who's got neck pain for a month and do this study on them. You're going to look at somebody who's been symptomatic for three, four, five, six months and then say, why are they still symptomatic? And if we have these findings, we can say this person actually is uh, injured. This goes to the question of um, whether or not normal global movement is important, like the kind of things that you were talking about in the court, Niels. We were saying, oh, someone will point out and say, oh, they have normal movement. Well, normal movement, not examined by video x-ray. Video x-ray says you may have normal movement like this, but if we look um, intersegmentally, we have actual findings that can tell us this person is injured. So I think this will be a very good study, and uh, I have more work to do on it. The, the, the data are a, a bit unwieldy to work with right now, but you're seeing, this came to me yesterday. Uh, that as we're, you know, we're just starting to, to plow into this. So you're seeing the most preliminary data. And this may change somewhat, but I think the model is going to stay fairly stable. So I show you that first because I actually have very limited time with you today. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way our flights worked out is I'm going to have to, as we say in the States, skedaddle uh, at about 20 after 2. Um, and uh, Bo, I didn't know if you wanted to take a break no, no, not before you go. Okay, all right, fair enough. So, so now I, I, I do want to talk about my favorite topic, which is uh, the issue of causality and causality of injury, because this is actually a very, I think it's, it's very on point with a lot of the issues we've been talking about um, earlier today and some of the problems that we deal with with um, the medical legal aspects of, of chronic injury after whiplash trauma. So here, now I get to get into my, my actual, my topic that I'm really interested in. Um, I, I use this quote because I think this is a very important point that hopefully will come clear to you. Um, it, it's from The Little Prince, some of you may recognize it, but uh, it has to do with the fact that the thing that we're most concerned about when we're talking about causality is the thing that we cannot see. Uh, it's something that we have to infer. Uh, in the United States and elsewhere, uh, technical, fancy, uh, impressive sounding uh, information expert testimony uh, is often given in court and can be used to convict somebody of murder, for example, which we later find out is a completely worthless uh, unreliable um, uh, approach or, um, or technology. And a classic example, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, is bite mark um, testimony, bite mark expert testimony. In fact, <coughs> it is, uh, was the misuse of this particular uh, technology, this particular forensic approach, which triggered a, um, an analysis and essentially tear down of almost all the forensic sciences that took place in the United States in 2009 um, when there was publication of a, um, a, a book basically that said uh, the forensic sciences are really, really unreliable. We're lacking in uh, the ability to test cons conclusions. We're, we're la lacking in the ability to, to know how often we have false positives. Um, uh, to understand basic functions of, of test accuracy which is so critical to knowing when an opinion is accurate or not. That concept almost has no place whatsoever in the court systems in Sweden anymore, uh, at least not for uh, injury litigation that I've been exposed to. In the United States, this has led to uh, a, a, a huge number of exonerations based on latent testing of DNA kits uh, for uh, murders, rapes, all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, 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 different uh, convictions that we've had that have been overturned because we knew, we finally actually knew this person didn't do it, and these people have been uh, released from prison. Some of them in the United States, unfortunately, we still have death row. Some of them uh, have been executed, uh, and we found out later that there was enough information to question whether or not they should have been even convicted in the first place. Uh, a lot of times this kind of testimony 
relies on probabilistic uh, inference, probabilistic um, expert opinion. And this was a classic example of the Sally Clark case. I don't know if you, uh, if this is familiar to anybody. This was a, a British solicitor um, who had two children who died of crib death, cot death. Um, you know, uh, you guys, what do you guys call it here? Crib death. Um, um, it, and uh, uh, she, <coughs> sudden infant death. There you go. Yeah. Is that is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sudden infant death uh, syndrome. Um, and, and this led to this woman's conviction based on the testimony by um, a, a very woman pediatrician that there was a 73 million to one chance probability that she murdered her kids because there was a 1 in 73 million chance that they died just coincidentally. Um, of course, overlooking the fact that, yeah, they probably didn't die coincidentally. That doesn't mean she murdered them. They died because there's other stuff going on. They're, they have the same genetic uh, makeup. They're in the same environment. I mean, there are other things other than murder that kill children. Um, that's why it's called sudden unexplained or infant death syndrome. Uh, <laughs> she was ultimately released and ultimately actually committed suicide after she was released. Rather a terrible story. But the man who gave the testimony against her was struck off the medical licensure board. Now I give you all that as a background because of the sort of mess that is medical causation now, particularly when we're talking about something which is, uh, which you can say anything you want about apparently in, in many courts. Uh, uh, you, you, there's no, in, in, particularly in Sweden, I mean my observation has been that there's almost no attention paid to um, concepts of reliability when discussing causation. <coughs> causation is something different than what you're going to hear about later. I'm not talking about diagnosis. Diagnosis is something that we can argue about. Well, do they have instability or do they, are they, do they have central sensitization? Or, uh, you know, are you looking for the kind of things that, uh, that Bjorn, where Bjorn goes? We have to leave. He's uh, back. Oh, well, I'm going to say all sorts of things about Bjorn now. <laughs> that terrible, terrible guy Bjorn. No, uh, you know, the, the interesting things he was talking about diagnostically. Uh, those, those don't have to do with causation so much. That, that really is identification of what the condition is. And so understanding that this is a different level of, of, um, of expert analysis, but it fits within what is required because we are talking about a condition that is disputed only in a medical legal setting. That's a very important concept. You're in a, you're in a, a car and you're minding your own business and somebody runs into you from behind and, and you have an injured neck and all of a sudden you're thrown into a system where immediately someone's going to point at you and call you a liar because you had the audacity to be injured by somebody else's negligence. That's, that's something completely new. This is a random event. Getting hit by somebody else in a traffic crash, for example, or having, having a, 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 a vehicle failure, for example, uh, that, that causes an injury which has nothing to do with anything that you did. It didn't cause the injury. That's a random event. Yet, all of a sudden, there is um, essentially the permission by the insurer that you pay your money to, to uh, point at you and say, well, I don't think you're telling the truth because it doesn't benefit us financially to admit that that's the case. And a fundamental aspect of that has to do with causality and causation. So when we talk about the debates, that has to do with pathology and diagnosis. But in my observation, cases are typically lost because of an issue with causation. I mean, you can get into, um, we don't, well, we think that the injury was this, and we think the injury was that. And sometimes the court just say, we don't know what the injury is, so we're not going to say there's any injury. As soon as you inject confusion uh, and, and uncertainty, then the person trying to establish the injury begins to lose. But causality doesn't have any kind of standards that we can point to that everybody understands. If I said to you, what's the method by which you determine the cause of this injury? 
he'd say, because it made most sense to me, most often. Because that's how we work in medicine. But the uncertainty <clears throat> is more widespread than you think. Um, if you take an example uh, of somebody who we don't really have a question as to what happened to them. And this isn't really somebody who was run over. I just found this because I thought it was sort of funny. So, um, but causality, if this person is dead, we would say it's pretty obvious. They got run over by a steamroller. And you can't possibly survive that. But we get confused. We get confused with the risk of death given what the steamroller did and what actually killed this person. We say, well, if he was run over by the steamroller, of course the steamroller killed him. But, but is that really true? Um, can you rule out the fact that this person died just before they were run over by the steamroller? Can you, can, if you come across the scene, can you rule out the fact that someone hit the person in the head with a, a hammer uh, and, and killed them that way and then ran over the steamroller? Not very likely, but the certainty that you have of what killed this person is injected with a little bit of uncertainty. Um, there's always some degree of uncertainty in a causal determination because the causation isn't what happened to this guy. This guy was run over by a steamroller. The causation question is what killed him. We know he's run over by a steamroller. We just don't know what killed him. We just think that's most likely. The way we get there is to reverse engineer what is this common sense determination. To step backwards in time and say, OK, well, what else could have killed him? What are the other options? And use that methodology to actually understand how we evaluate more subtle differences uh, in causal risk. Let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, the first principle you have to always grasp is that causation is unobservable. Just like with this guy, we can't see what caused his death. We can see what happened to him, but we can't see what caused his death. That's the outcome. And you cannot observe a cause. You can observe a diagnosis. If you show an x-ray of a broken leg, to a child like that, a five-year-old child would say, that leg is broken. Because that's obvious. You can observe that. <coughs> you cannot observe what caused the broken leg. If I say, I was in a traffic crash, and I had a broken leg, you'll say, well, no one's walking around with a broken leg, a broken femur, um, when they, you know, if, they, if they haven't had some sort of trauma. And you just take that as written. You can't see it. <laughs> I might have fallen out of a window. I might have done a bunch of other things. You're basing it on what I've told you. And what if we make it more complicated? What if I tell you I was in a crash and, 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 and actually there were two collisions. One was a side crash and the other was a frontal crash and I blacked out and then when I woke up I had a broken leg. I don't know which crash caused my broken leg. How would you know which crash caused the broken leg? You would not be able to see it. You have to make an inference. The inference would be based on risk because we can look at the first crash and say, oh, we know something about these crashes based on crashes that have happened before. Most people who break their leg break their leg in a crash like this, a frontal crash, because they have a big sudden load of the femur, right? Oh, yeah. uh, that's basic biomechanics of traffic crashes. And, and side impacts, not nearly as much. In fact, t people break their legs ten times more often in this crash than this one. Okay, and if you ask me which... Car, we're just into the other one. It's a front crash. In the, this the, is our guy. Our guy is here okay. and he's here. But in the other... Don't, don't give me any guff. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, if he's, if he's this guy or he's one of those guys. So it's either a frontal crash or a side crash. We would say, well, it's probably ten times more likely. It's not probably. It is ten times more likely without more evidence that they broke their leg in the one crash with the highest risk. So where do we get risk from? Well, we can say something about individuals using risk. For example, if we look at these two folks, we can say who's more likely to have a heart attack tomorrow, 
Anybody, any question here? How old is this guy? Yeah. Don't know. How old is this guy? Don't know. In fact, this guy is older than this guy. Is, if we know this guy is older than this guy, isn't he at higher risk for a heart attack? No. So then why did we say this guy was at higher risk? Yeah, he looks like he doesn't really exercise like this guy. This guy looks like he exercises. We think that exercising reduces risk, and well, eating too many donuts increases risk. That makes sense. But where do we get that information from? We predict the future based on what's happened in the past. So I know that this guy is more likely to have a heart attack because we've studied guys like him, and we've compared them to guys like them. And we did that with other people other than <coughs> this guy. I'm not saying this guy is going to have a heart attack tomorrow. But I will tell you, if this guy doesn't start doing this and stop doing that, if he has a heart attack tomorrow, what am I going to say caused it? I'm going to say it's his lifestyle. So I start to talk about causation based on risk not based on what I see in the person, but what I know from other people. This is a really important concept to get. How risk is something that we don't get from an individual. It's something we infer by looking at an individual. And understanding where the, how the individual relates to other people in the same category as them. But we can't know what anybody's risk is. As far as uh, looking at them and saying, I know that your risk is something uh, that's inherent to you without knowing what that meant to somebody else. We still have to go back and go into epidemiologic study to understand that. So we, we've got to have some sort of background information, scientifically reliable information that's been collected in a way that is, um, that is uh, deemed uh, uh, appropriate for the type of information that is gathered. Epidemiology typically deals with frequency of, of, of severe <coughs> disease or risk factors for those injuries. Those are determinants and, and, and how to prevent it. But if you look at causality and causation, ultimately all stems from epidemiologic, an epidemiologic approach and epidemiologic concepts. Now this creates big problems when we're talking about court. When we get into court, causal determinations are made by clinicians. Uh, but the problem is that if you're talking about individual causation, you have to know something about risk. Risk comes from epidemiologic study, and epidemiologists do not normally look at individuals, nor do they talk about uh, uh, causality in individuals. We have no standardized training in causation or causality that is universal at the present time in medical schools. This doesn't happen. My particular area of forensic medicine is the application of probabilistic information based on epidemiology to investigate specific cause. What I'll be talking to you about today is how that is applied to the investigation of cause in chronic pain after whiplash. I uh, head a program in forensic medicine, uh, for uh, mostly for physicians, uh, at Mossbrook University, which has a focus in this concept of understanding how probability is used within the within the context of forensic uh, medicine, largely to assess causality and causation, but also to do with having to do with uh, test validity and accuracy. And we've published many papers on this topic. Um, so how do we get from this concept relating to populations to individuals? Think about this. Why do you vaccinate children? <coughs> you vaccinate children so they don't get sick. You don't, they, you don't vaccinate children because they're sick. You vaccinate them because you have a belief that in the future, the child is less likely to get sick if you've done something now to prevent it. Why do you know that? Where does that information come from? epidemiologic study of children who have been vaccinated versus children who haven't been vaccinated. If you have a neighbor who didn't vaccinate their, their child for whooping cough, and the child gets whooping cough, and somebody says, 
what do you think caused the whooping cough? And it turns out that 99% of cases of whooping cough are prevented by a vaccine. You'll say, well, 99% of the cause is probably the fact they didn't vaccinate. Because if they vaccinated, then there's almost 100% almost chance the child wouldn't get ill. <clears throat> that makes sense. But you can't see it. You have to know something about populations other than the child who's sick. <clears throat> You can look at any sort of causal uh, uh, relationship. Why do we look both ways before we cross the street? Because if we don't, we might get run over. If somebody doesn't look and they get run over, what's the cause of them getting run over? The fact they didn't look. That's more probable. It could be something else, but you're going to think it's a lot more likely they did something that increased their risk. The way you actually measure cause is by using a principle called attributable risk. Attributable risk is the proportion of disease or injury in the population who's exposed that's caused by the agent, whatever the exposure is, and that's prevented when you get rid of the agent. This becomes very important when we're talking about traffic crash. Take a traffic crash away from somebody's life, would they still be injured? That starts to become the pivotal question. Not so much even what is their injury. I mean, that's important as well. But would they have whatever they have now? Whatever it is. However you want to diagnose it. Instability, um, uh, injury to the, to the uh, you know, neurologic uh, uh, apparatus. Whatever that diagnosis is, would you have it if you hadn't had the trauma? If they'd been home and, and sitting on their sofa at the time of the crash. So you're talking about this very simple idea where you take all of the risk in the exposed group, you compare it to the risk in the unexposed group, and you look at the excess. And the excess is the risk attributable to the exposure. Like in my example of the car crash, if people get femur fractured 10 times more often in frontal crashes than they do in side crashes, and the attributable risk to the frontal crash for the fracture is 9 out of 10. Because if you take away the frontal crash, you get rid of 9 out of 10 femur fractures. 90% of the time, this guy wouldn't have a femur fracture if he only had the side impact. We turn this into probability of cause. This is how this is used in a legal setting. So let me give you one more example so you understand this. And I'll stop beating on this particular horse. And we'll move on to something else. But, but here's how you get, again, from the population to the individual. Let's take um, smoking and lung cancer and talk about the concept of absolute risk. That is, how often do people get lung cancer when they smoke? If we say the risk of cancer among smokers is, you know, let's say a 40-pack um, a year smoker, uh, so one pack per day for 40, 40 years, that the risk of cancer amongst that group is 20%. One out of five people get lung cancer. Um, if we compare that to people who were just like our guy, our, our, our population who smoke, but don't smoke, same age and everything else, and we say it's only 1%, well, this 20% doesn't do very much for you. I mean, it doesn't tell you there's a 20% chance that an individual has cancer. Whether they have cancer or not, that's the diagnosis. That's observed. You look at a, a histological slide, and you say, this is cancer. No, what we have to do is realize which population an individual falls into. So if you're talking about people who smoke and have lung cancer, then we do this. And we only look at those people who are ill. And we say, well, amongst the people who are ill and who smoke, how often would they be ill if they hadn't smoked? That's 1% out of the 20%, or 5% of the total. That means the attributable risk is 19 out of 20%. Follow me so far? Maybe this is all very simple for you guys, but a lot of people have a hard time following this sometimes. But this is the essence. You're looking at causality. This is the closest you'll ever get to seeing what a cause is, is by putting up a couple bar graphs and seeing which one's bigger. How do we translate that to Joe, who got lung cancer after his 40-pack year habit? We just say we took 100 Joes, and we followed them forward in time. 20 of them got lung cancer. We took 100 Joes who didn't smoke, followed them forward. We got one who got lung cancer. And then when we asked how many Joes 
do we end up with lung cancer if Joe doesn't smoke? We have one instead of 20, which is 95%. It translates perfectly in that sort of a setting. So here's where things started to get very interesting. I've been writing about this topic for a long time um, uh, on how we have to integrate this concept of attributable risk and, and more epidemiologic approach to causality into the legal system. Because the legal system demands of clinicians something that nobody else does. Nobody else says, so tell me what caused this injury. You don't really care about that in a clinical setting. The, the patient says they got in a crash and they had the problems afterwards. Nobody's, nobody's going to ask you if that's true until you get into court. And yet, if you don't have the tools to answer those questions, then you don't really know how to answer those questions <coughs> in a systematically reliable way. I have written a lot about uh, a systematically reliable way based on what we have done in the past 50 years on assessing causality. In 2016, the U.S. Court of Appeals, which is our, our highest court in our land with the exception of the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court wouldn't hear this case because this isn't a case that has to do with constitutional law. So this is the highest court in the land. The U.S. Court of Appeals set forth generally accepted methods for assessing injury cause. And in doing so, they talked about a three-step process of injury causation that involved the use of epidemiologic methods. This was important for a number of reasons. Um, one is, uh, and this came out of um, uh, the 10th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals and included uh, on the panel that decided on it one of our Supreme Court justices now. So our newest Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court justice was on this panel, and it was unanimous. And what, what they did was they looked at the methods employed by this, this doc who was challenged at a very high level in federal court on his methods for assessing an injury of somebody who'd been in a traffic crash. And he says, I do three steps. I start with my first step, which is to look at general cause, whether or not the injury can result from the type of the collision the person was in. I looked at the timing between the crash and the onset of the symptoms. And then I look at whether there are alternative causes that are more likely relative to the crash at the same point in time. The paper he cited to for the basis was that, for that methodology was a paper that I published in 2009 in, in which we described a three-step methodology of uh, biologic plausibility or general causation, uh, the second criterion being uh, uh, the temporal association, the third being whether there's a more likely alternative explanation. This was very important for a number of reasons. One is that the highest court in the United States had now adopted a methodology that was systematic, where you could say they went through one, two, three steps, and, and this is what is generally accepted. But, and not just the fact that, because I wrote it, which I thought was really good too, don't get me wrong, but because this was, um, there was no dissent. Everybody said, yes, this is the way we're supposed to do it. We start with the concept of what are called the Hill criteria, uh, implausibility, <coughs> and we assess risk. We then assess the temporal association between the event and the injury, and we assess whether this person was more likely to have the same injury at the same time had they not been in the crash. This is a methodology called counterfactual causation, or counterfactual causality, which very simply asks the but for question. But for the event, would this person have the injury? But for the event, would this person have the disability? But for the event, would this person not be able to work three years later, five years later? So you see, when I talk about the fact that this really doesn't address diagnosis, that's the next step, the diagnosis. But the first step has to be, well, what's the cause of whatever's wrong with them right now? And let's get there first by saying, well, if the crash hadn't happened, would they still have the injury? And we find that out by looking at the individual. So here's an example of how this might be applied to, a, let's say, an average case. So you have a man, let's say 40 years old, with a three-year-old history of, of neck treatment. 
he gets a no damage crash, let's say uh, five miles per hour delta V or eight kilometers per hour delta V uh, or less. No damage, basically bumper to bumper. Let's say in our example, he has neck and arm pain, goes to the emergency department, and a week later he has a disc herniation and he undergoes neck surgery. And then he ultimately develops chronic pain, he can't work anymore, so we have somebody three, four, five years later who is disabled, who was not disabled before the crash. We would walk through, uh, well, of course we would have the, the, uh, the insur insurers, experts, who said that everything should have gotten better based on some sort of traumatic principle or some some sort of uh, nonsensical standard that is used that says, well, most people are like this, therefore this person must be like this. There's, there's, there's no um, accuracy to that kind of a test. Most people aren't over six foot two inches tall, therefore this person is not over six foot two. Uh, most people don't die of a heart attack at 45, therefore this person didn't die at 45. You can't use a probabilistic approach to revise what happened. What happened, happened. Afterwards, you can explain it by saying, well, what's most likely, given the context? But somebody's got to go into court and hold these experts' feet to the fire and say, how often is, is your test right or wrong? Show me some data. <coughs> We're, we, we have risk data on everything in this case. Where's your risk data to show that for everybody who gets into a traffic crash, the only people who are really hurt are people who fall within this 72-hour rule or some nonsense? So you, you, the, the, uh, the standards that are being applied to the treating clinicians, they're just getting a, 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 often a free pass for the insurer's experts. The radiologist says there's no evidence of acute trauma. Yeah, okay. Do you, ha do you have to have acute trauma that you can see on a, an x-ray? How often is there acute trauma that you can't see on an x-ray? Right? Ola was just talking about this from a, a PhD thesis done back in the 90s, I think. The autopsy studies that we have. Ganilla was involved with some of this research as well. Uh, we know that people get injuries you can't see on an x-ray or a CT scan or an MRI. And the fact that you have a negative MRI, CT, or X-ray does not mean you don't have an injury. So again, you have a test where you're implying accuracy that doesn't exist. The false positive rate for the X-ray was negative, but the person still hurt, therefore the person doesn't have an injury. The false positive, or, or a false positive of that test for saying the person isn't hurt is about 100%. In other words, it's almost always going to be wrong because there's another explanation for why they hurt. There are biomechanical experts who say that the you know, forces are the same as some sort of a, a, an ordinary activity. This is more popular in the United States, I think, than over here. But it's probably making its way over here as well. So we evaluate the plausibility of the injury in, in our man. And we say, can you get uh, a disc injury and a, a rear impact collision with no damage? And the answer is yes, of course you can. That's well established. There's, there's, we, we have a plausible biomechanical load, and these Hill criteria are the universal standard by which we assess causality. Nobody can argue with this. There are 5,000 publications <laughs> applying the Hill criteria. Uh, it's used by every uh, uh, drug assessment, uh, health uh, uh, care research group. It's, it's the standard for assessing uh, uh, causal relationships. And moreover, we know that there's no absolute injury threshold for a disc injury. Can you, can you herniate a disc in your neck if you sneeze? Yes. Can you herni herniate a disc in your neck if you have no trauma? Yes. If you can get a herniated disc from no trauma, can you not get a herniated disc from some trauma? Yes, of course. In fact, Virtually any kind of injury can be attributed to virtually any kind of a crash. I mean, you don't really have traffic crashes where somebody's hit from behind, there's no damage from their car to their car, and they say, oh, I broke my leg, and we're just not sure how it happens. It really doesn't happen. 
most of the injuries we're talking about are the kind of injuries that either are imaging occult, you can't see it on an x-ray, you can't see it on a CT scan, or it's detected by other forms of diagnosis. It's, uh, uh, where's Karsten? Oh, there you are. Sure. I was looking, I looked all over you. Uh, uh, you uh, Karsten will talk about uh, neurootological assessments. Who even knows about this? I mean, this, this is a one-tenth of one percent of the people who evaluate these injuries even look for the kind of injuries he looks for. What, you, do you know in a medical record where it says WNL? Do you know this? In, in, a, in a, you know, in a, uh, an English? It, it's supposed to stand for within normal limits. So you talk about it, but you know the joke is? WNL stands for we never looked. <laughs> if you don't look, you won't find it. We already know from epidemiologic study in an 8 kilometer per hour crash, 35% of people who are exposed to real world crashes are hurt. This is Swedish and Japanese data. We know that, that uh, 1 in 29 have chronic pain that probably will never go away. It's lasting longer than 6 months. And 1 in 40 will have signs of a cervical disc injury. This is fact. That's, that's the reliable sign. Even, we even know that when you put people who are, who are in crash tests uh, into cars, who people who volunteer say, yeah, I'll, I'll sit in a car for a crash test, we know that at, at 8 kilometers per hour, you actually hurt to some degree 40% of them. So this is not a benign event. So we know that plausibility is well established. What about temporality? Well. Temporal proximity is the closest thing we have to a measure of causality. Because the closer two things are in time, the less likely it is that they occurred coincidentally. And that's what we think in our mind. We see two things happen at the same time. We think, well, gee, that makes pretty good sense. Because when you look, for example, at, at one ball hitting the other, and you say, did the red ball cause the blue ball to move, what would you answer? You would say yes. yes. How about this one? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the blue ball was stuck. How about this one? No way. Because we're not talking about transfer momentum anymore, right? We're not talking about physics. That doesn't make any sense. It can't work that way. But. Did this ball really cause this ball to move? Or are those just two colored disks that I moved because I'm such a whiz with animation in, in PowerPoint? There's no causality there. You infer causality because you observe something. But there's no physics. You have to look behind. It's the guy who got run over the steamroller. Yeah, he was killed by the steamroller. You don't know that. You think that makes sense. But temporality is how we get there. Because that's what dictates step three. Alternative causes are only given the time that the alternative causes could have acted. So what's the chance our guy in our example would have spontaneously developed symptoms of the surgical disc right at the same time as the crash? Because he got out of that car with neck pain within five minutes of the crash. He says, I got pain down my arm, I got pain in my neck, and he ends up having surgery for a herniated disc. <coughs> Do we know something about the chance that this guy, had he not been in the crash, was going to develop the same problems? Well, we know this. We know from hospital data, I mean, this is good epidemiologic data, there's less than one in 2,000 men who are 40 years old have neck surgery in a year. That's in the U.S. where we do a lot more neck surgery. Well, we are not talking about the same year as the crash, because we're talking about a crash and then symptoms within five minutes. Even if we just look at the same day, it's one in 730,000 that he was going to develop the same problems in the same day. And the same hour is one in 18 million that this was just going to happen at this time. This is a guy who was fine five seconds before a crash, and five, five minutes after the crash, he has a problem that becomes surgical. So what do we do with that? Well, we can, very simply, 
We say the risk of injury from the crash. Okay, we'll put it at 1 in 40. That's the risk of, of, of a disc injury from the crash. The risk of injury at the same time, but if the crash doesn't occur, he just starts to have this problem. Well, just at, on the same day is 1 in 730,000. I'm not even talking about the same five minutes or the same 30 seconds. I'm talking about the same day. Well, that's a ratio of 18,000 to 1, which is the same thing as a 99.99% .99 probability of cause. But you say, this man had problems three years before the crash. Maybe he was much more likely to develop problems if the crash hadn't happened. Okay, I'll bite. That's fine. We'll say the risk of injury from the crash is still 1 in 40, although if we say he's more likely to develop problems if the crash doesn't happen, isn't he also more likely to develop problems if the crash does happen? Isn't he more, isn't he more fragile regardless? But let's multiply the chance of him developing all these problems by 100. Let's put this man in the most susceptible 1% of the population. This is called a safety analysis. I make every assumption against my case. Still, it's 180 to 1. That's still more than 99% probability of cause. That's good enough for court. That's good enough for any venue. <coughs> Clearly, you've met the more probable than not standard. This methodology can be used to assess how the insurer's experts have evaluated a case. What's the chance? What's the chance at the same time the injured man was going to have all these problems, as you say? What's the chance this was going to happen? No idea. Well, no idea means you shouldn't be able to testify about it because you don't have a reliable basis for it. Let me give you a couple more points to consider in the context here. I'm not talking about traffic crashes now. I want to talk about some other ways to illustrate these. A trigger versus a risk factor. The crash becomes the trigger for the chronic pain. The risk factor for the chronic pain are the kind of things that we talked about earlier. Uh, a history of Ehlers Danlos, um, a history of fibromyalgia, or, or a, a history of neck pain. Those are risk factors. But the outcome ends up being multifactorial. <laughs> I'll show you what I mean. Um, <coughs> so our guy had a history of neck problems. That made him more likely to be injured in the crash, but also more likely to have problems in the absence of the crash. I, I like the example of looking at stroke. Let's take things that make us more likely to have a, uh, someone more likely to have a stroke. Like, you know, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, age, uh, atrial fibrillation, diabetes. All these things are stroke risk factors. Knowing that risk factors are present does not become exculpatory for a trigger. This is a little bit, a, a little bit complicated, but let, let me give you an example. This is a real life example from one of my cases. There's a man with uh, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, AFib, and hypothyroid. All things that, well, at least some of the things which can contribute to stroke. Um, he was taking medication for hypothyroid but he was given a 30-day prescription that was an overdose. It was 12 times higher than it should have been. Um, we know that stroke risk goes up with hyperthyroidism. And we created, artificially created, hyperthyroidism. This guy had a stroke two weeks into that time. So we have temporality. We have a plausible mechanism, right? Because if you give somebody this medicine, you, may, you, you cause them to have increased risk of stroke. But the, and the pharmacy that got sued said, yeah, but he had all these risk factors anyway. So what do you do with that? You know, because that is often pointed to as essentially exculpatory. You know, it's, it, it means it's not our fault because this guy had all these problems. This guy had neck problems before. He had degenerative changes in his neck before. Yeah, but he wasn't seeking care and he had no symptoms. That's, that's what he was afterwards. So you have to look at the, the, the second two steps together. If we say this was the man before the thyroid prescription, we can actually assess what his non-thyroid overdose 
risk was. Um, so this is him before. This is him afterwards. We just add a little bit of risk, right? But if we take him before and we look at what his 10-year risk is, it was 11.9%. 1 in 8. This is based on all the risk factors he had. His one-year risk was 1 1.2. But what was the time frame we're interested in? Two weeks. He's doing fine, not having a stroke. He gets the medicine. Now he's within the hazard period of the risk factor, the overdose. And within two weeks, he has the stroke. So what's his two-week risk? It's 1 in 2,158. Is this man likely to have a stroke during the two-week period if he doesn't get the thyroid medicine? No. He's at a less than 1 in 2100 risk of having a stroke in that two-week period. Take away the thyroid medicine, take away the thyroid overdose, and you take away a more probable than not cause. Add that little bit extra of risk. What's the probability of stroke? It's 100%. He has a stroke. See, remember... <clears throat> We turn this into an epidemiologic study. We have one guy, that's all we've got. He has a stroke in two weeks. But we don't know what the chance is he's going to have a stroke if you give him thyroid. But we do know the chance that he's going to have a stroke if you don't give him thyroid. So we say, well, what's the chance this was going to happen, even given all his risk factors in the absence of the risk factor? Anybody got an idea where I'm going here? It's the principle of the straw that breaks the camel's back. So you take away the straw. The straw isn't much, but the straw is what puts him over the top. The straw is what becomes the causal factor, without which you wouldn't have the broken back on the camel, the stroke, or the chronic pain, perhaps need for surgery, or whatever injury you have in somebody who's been in a traffic crash. So even when the trigger event increases risk by less than 50%, it can still be what accounts for the injury if in the absence of the trigger event, the risk is low. So we look at the infrequency of the outcome. Even for a man with all sorts of problems, if he's got a 10-year history of, of, of no problems, of no pain, no seeking care. And that's the end of my talk. Thanks, Bjorn. <laughs> Okay, just in. I, was, I was pretending I was done. But thank you for clapping anyway. Uh, I have one more point, which is to say that coincidence is comp quantifiable. I, I, this will be the last thing I'll point out. Um, and this has to do with this allegation that an injury would have occurred despite uh, the injury event. Um, so, basically you're talking about a very standard defense, which is to say this person had degenerative changes in their spine, they had a prior history of problems, um, and therefore they were going to have these problems anyway. No, no one can say otherwise. Um, therefore, what happened to them is purely a coincidence to the fact that they were exposed to an event that could cause the injury. It's all coincidence. Um, well, you only know that a coincidence has occurred when two things can't be related, right? When the rooster gets up in the morning and cock-a-doodle-doo and the sun comes up, you don't say the rooster caused the sun to come up. Because it's, well, it's actually not coincidental, it's causal, it's just reverse causal. Mm. The sun causes the rooster to cock-a-doodle-doo. Um, but the, sun, the rooster can't cause the sun to, uh, uh, to come up. If I go outside and I say, because I point at the sky, there's a plane flying overhead. How about that? That's pure coincidence there really is a plane flying overhead. It didn't make the plane fly overhead. That's pure coincidence, because it can't be related. I can't make the plane fly overhead. But if somebody says, well, the fact that somebody has chronic pain after a traffic crash must be coincidence, because it was going to happen anyway, you, you actually don't have the criteria for coincidence. What you have is you've selectively taken one cause over another cause because you like this cause, but you haven't quantified it which you do with the attributable risk analysis I talked about earlier. But you can also coincident, uh, uh, quantify coincidence via looking at uh, time frames. I'll show you what I mean. And again, I'm going to use a, a case, uh, one of my cases. Um, 
where I've employed this idea, but I think it does a good job of illustrating the point. This is a 78-year-old woman who died after a fall, and she was very sick. She was in a nursing home. She had uh, a history of heart attack and uh, congestive uh, uh, coronary uh, heart disease and all sorts of problems, kidney disease. But they left her alone. She fell. She struck her head. Um, she was bed-bound afterwards, even though she had no intracranial bleed. And she just went into a, 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 a swift decline, and she died 65 days later. The nursing home was sued for not paying attention to what was going on with her. And uh, their defense was that death was imminent. She was a very sick lady. She was virtually in hospice care, was the way they, they presented the, the, uh, the case. So this invoked the concept of a random match analysis. What's the probability of two things occurring at the same point in time if they're completely unrelated? I mean, the chance that I'm going to go outside and do this and there's going to be a plane going overhead, those two things, to be, you know, they're purely coincidental. I mean, if, if uh, planes fly overhead every minute, it's going to be more likely to happen than if they only fly over every hour. What I did in this case was I looked at the life expectancy for the woman based on her comorbidities, which was only 2.9 years. I looked at 65 days relative to that, which gave us a reduction in average life expectancy of 94%. And then I just looked at the life expectancy on a bell curve. Here's her date of death. Here's the 65 days. There's your temporal proximity. What's the chance that this was going to happen at that time, given what we knew about her life expectancy? Well, she could have died during this 65 days or any other 65 days other than the one in which she also fell. But the coincidence allegation is that the two things happen at the same point in time as pure coincidence. So we use the concept of random match, which is, uh, think about two die. You roll them, the chance you're going to get two sixes is what? In the same roll. Anybody? Nobody plays graphs. What? One in 36. One in 36, precisely. You can use a craps matrix to find out that all the combinations of rolls, you can have a one and a two and a three and a whatever, but only, there's only one six and a six and a one. <coughs> so instead of having to do with just one die probability, you actually multiply them. It's very simple. We do the same thing with our 65 days. What's the chance of these two events being unrelated and thus occurring during the same 65 days, the death and the fall. 65 days is 4% of the total number of days. This gives me 25 periods out of the entire number of days. So I take the chance of fall times the chance of dying, 1 in 25 times 1 in 25, and I get a 1 in 625 probability that this is purely coincidental. I understand the, the concept behind it. I went through it quickly because I have to go catch a flight. Um, I probably should have left when I said goodbye. I'm leaving. Um, but uh, I, I want you to see behind the, the curtain, the facade of I'm a professor and um, I'm a very important person with a deep voice and a nice CV and, and this person wasn't hurt because of the traumatic principle. Start looking behind us and, and being able to actually interrogate the basis for a, a, a causal determination. And, and, and start introducing these ideas, which uh, Ola has put into a, a paper. You have picked up on the three-step uh, uh, causation analysis. And there are other papers that are starting to do this as well. Let's get this into the courts anytime that anything gets into court. I'll come testify anytime by video. I've done it before. Uh, I'll just show up. I'm on for an hour. I'm off. It's easy. And I'll talk about these concepts and the, their general acceptance how they're part of science. And that this becomes a, a springboard from which to then say, well, everybody really needs to apply the same methods. And once we have better uh, systematic uh, rigor, then we start to get decisions that are based on, on real evidence. We start to test theories like uh, uh, traumatic principle and that sort of thing that don't have any scientific basis and can't be shown to have any test accuracy, and we start to actually change what kind of results we get in court. Anyway, there's so much more to say, but 
I do have to go. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Annalie, for putting this all together. You are, thank you for having this in your beautiful clinic. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you all for coming.